Halloween 1991. An elite pararescue team is on a mission to save a stranded sailor. We just knew that we were in for a hell of a ride. But they don't know. They're flying straight into the perfect storm. There isn't anything you can do about it. You can't tell God to turn the weather off. We're starting now to realize we're at, at our limits. Mayday, mayday, mayday. Forced to ditch in the freezing Atlantic waters. Instantly, the blades contacted the water, and that's when it got really violent. Battling waves 10 stories high. This was a bad situation. Now it's the rescuers who need rescuing from the perfect storm. It was clear to me that ultimately I was going to drown. It's Halloween, and off the eastern seaboard, a violent storm is brewing. Pararescue man John Spillane has been called in for an urgent mission. You kicking up, huh? A pararescue man is a skydiving, mountain climbing, scuba diving, surviving medic. We would take enormous risk, and we were willing to take that risk uh, to save life. He's part of a military chopper crew standing by to rescue sailors trapped by the storm. The training flight's off. Yeah, yeah. Come on. What is it? We've got a rescue mission from the Coast Guard. Fellow pararescue man Rick Smith has news of a stranded yacht off the coast. Okay, guys, take a seat. So, we got a long Pilot race. Dave Ravola leads the five man team. We all evaluated the weather and yeah, it, it is risky, but there was somebody's life at stake. The stranded yacht is located 450 kilometers off the coast. 39, 57 minutes north. Co-pilot Graham Bushaw will navigate them there. In this particular situation, 250 nautical miles out to sea, it's beyond the range of most helicopters. So yes, it, it ramps up the risk on the mission substantially. Only the military's helicopters can reach the yacht. Looks like this could get rough. We all set? Yes, sir. But it'll require dangerous mid-air refueling. OK, Jim, cockpit checklist. Yeah, APU control switch. The crew of Air Force Rescue 110 is ready to roll. As they leave, reports come in that the weather system off the east coast is developing fast. Two massive fronts are colliding with a hurricane. But the forecasters have no idea how dangerous it will become. Shall I open the sunroof? The Joker in our pack is by far Graham Bashore. He's uh, a lot of fun to be around, and uh, he certainly is, uh, is a Joker. There's no doubt about it. So what do you do for Halloween, Graham? I go to my sister Elaine's. We do a party there every year, like an annual thing. We all work together uh, very well. Dave, the aircraft commander, very goal-oriented individual. Being in charge and being a leader kind of comes naturally to me. When I was a, uh, a kid, I mean, I was never the first or second to be picked. I was always the captain. Myself, uh, I'm a little more laid back. I think Jim Mioli falls more into that category also. I loved helicopters, anything about helicopters. Then when you add the neat kind of man toy stuff that we we have, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. Rick was reserved on the quiet side, very professional, and John was more vocal than Rick. I guess it was a, a, an, an amazing time in my life. I was only married at this point two years. Uh, we were expecting our first child. My wife was five months pregnant. Half an hour in, and the crew get ready for the first refueling. Airspeed 120, altitude 1500. We have got 45 minutes of gas left. 
In these turbulent conditions, Dave Rivola's skills as a pilot will be tested to the limit. You need to overcome the anxiety and the fear factor of, of flying that close to another airplane. He needs to gently ease the helicopter's probe into a supply line, trailing behind a flying fuel tanker. You know, you've got spinning rotor blades that are rotating around, you know, at a very, very high velocity. And obviously, uh, if that hits anything, you know, there's going to be a problem. OK, extending the refueling probe. Air Force Rescue 988 to Air Force Rescue 110. Copy that. It's like playing a video game and getting points. Way to go. Air Force Rescue 1. When you hit that drogue, even in clear weather, it's like, whoop, you know. We have copy. It always makes you feel good. Air Force Rescue 988 to Air Force Rescue 1. The crew now has enough fuel to reach the stricken yacht. But as they plow on, weather conditions deteriorate. I do remember having butterflies in my stomach because it was going to be a challenging mission. We become aware that the winds are very gusty. The waves are up to 40 feet. And we're starting now to realize we're at, at our limits. The youngest of the crew, Jim Mioli, has never flown in weather this bad. I just got out of school. I was very green. Graduated, uh, you know, just a less than a year before, so I was very new, very green, rookie. Nervous? Yeah, I'm a little. Nerves are good. Two hours in, Air Force Rescue 110 reaches the stranded yachtsman. Ah! Air Force Rescue 110 to Air Force Rescue 988, we have visual contact. I don't like the look of this, Dave. And this is where it got dicey, because the sail had been ripped off. The mass was pretty much straight up. And now the seas uh, were, uh, were very, very rough. And uh, the winds were, were, uh, were very strong. Again, this guy in the boat, he looked like, to me, like a rubber ducky in a bathtub. He's just getting splashed around or knocked around. The plan is for John and Rick to rope down into the sea. Pretty extreme, huh? Then Jim will hoist them all back to safety. But in this weather, it won't be an easy pickup. It sounds quite simple. Let's send a cable down, somebody grabs it, and they get up inside the helicopter. It is not even remotely close to that easy. I have no problem putting PJs in that type of environment. They are extremely uh, uh, good swimmers, uh, extreme physical conditioning, no concern at all that they would be able to swim over to the boat and get this guy off the boat. The big concern was getting everybody back into the helicopter. Put two PJs in the water and we can't get them on, now we have three survivors that we have to deal with. Okay, that looks rough. Um, what do you guys think? It's Jim's responsibility to winch everybody safely back to the chopper. Can you get us any closer, Dave? That's about as close as I can go. I don't want to get too, too tight to the mast. It's his call whether or not they go for the rescue. And one of the big problems is with the hoist cable, it'll act like a cutter and literally cut through, you know, arms, cut off arms, or, or worse, maybe wrapped around that person's neck literally decapitate him. It's your call, Jim. Let's get back. Oh. How are we doing back there, Jim? Nah, it's too risky. I can't do it. It was a tough decision. It really was. We went all the way out to try to get this guy up, and, uh, and you know, just I didn't think I could do it. OK, let's head back. Radio in the decision. Air Force 110 to Air Force 980. That was the uh, first mission I was on where, uh, you know, we had to actually turn around and say no to it. Uh, that was a very disheartening experience. Conditions too poor to execute rescue. Over. But it was the right decision. It's, it's not all like Hollywood, you know? Uh, the hero doesn't always come out alive, and everything works out fine. 
I thought that that took a lot of courage for Jim to speak up. To be right there looking at that survivor, ready to go. The most junior person on the crew spoke up and said, I don't think we can do this mission. Air Force Rescue 110 heads back, leaving the yachtsman to wait for a ship rescue. But home is still 450 kilometers away. And the super storm is building. Like throwing gasoline on a fire, colliding storm fronts are re-energizing an old hurricane to become a cyclone of epic proportions. These are tough conditions for refueling, but Dave must take on fuel if he's to get the crew back to base. We came up on our fourth and final layer of fueling, and that's when the weather went from bad to horrendous uh, in almost the blink of an eye. I mean, we just knew that we were in for a hell of a ride. We did not know that we were flying inside basically a hurricane-force uh, storm. This is the worst weather conditions I had ever flown in, and uh, there isn't anything you can do about it. Uh, you can't tell God to turn the weather off. Dave has never refueled in weather conditions this severe. And I really had to fly this thing very aggressively. Airspeed 110, altitude 1,500 feet. There's plenty of dangers. You could bump into the 130, catastrophic failure, fall out of the sky. OK, we need to get this over with fast. You can bump into the hose with the rotor blades. You lose rotor blades and basically fall out of the sky. Um, you know, helicopter crashes, uh, uncontrolled crashes, are not normally survivable. There was turbulence that, uh, you know, was really rocking us left and right, up and down, any which way you can imagine. We were hanging out for dear life. Yeah. Guys are vomiting. The airplane being buffeted, you know, plus or minus 100 foot. I'm trying to go down, it's going up. We've got 20 minutes of gas. Fuel is running low. It's critical that we get it. There's no place else to go to put the helicopter down other than the ocean. They're still 150 kilometers from land. Where the hell is it gone? And he can't even see the refueling plane through the clouds. Back off! Back off! I couldn't hide from my own guys. They saw me up close and personal and what I was up against, trying to get this damn probe in this in, in this drove. Yeah, there were a few, few choice words that came out of my mouth inside the cockpit. There's no doubt about it. The cloud ceiling is dropping, going down to 500. Air Force Rescue 112. We're doing a lot of suggestions, turning in a different heading, different direction, climbing down, all different situations to find clearer air so we can get gas and get home. We'd like to try this at 500 feet. Dave takes the chopper lower to get below the storm. But the turbulence only gets worse. Come on. Come on. We'd been doing this for more than half an hour. Well, now I knew we were crossing that line, that things were beyond our control, that we may not get fuel. And once I realized that, uh, the, the thought of ditching the helicopter uh, became a reality. And uh, that was actually the, the most frightful period for me of that whole mission was that thought to realize we may have to abandon the helicopter. Altitude 490. Dave knows he may only have one more chance to connect with the refueling drogue and save his crew. Five minutes of fuel remaining. At that point, my low-level fuel lights begin flashing. Now it's decision time. If we don't get this fuel, we're all going swimming. Five minutes of fuel remaining. Dave has run out of time. He faces the hardest decision of his life. There was no option left. 
I continue to use that fuel, thinking of my own ego, that I can do this, that I can make this, you know, that could have killed everybody. He can't save the chopper, but he might be able to save his crew. With the last drops of fuel, Dave takes the chopper down to let them bail out. OK, listen up. We are ditching this chopper. Jim, prepare the life raft. John and Rick, get ready to jump. The pressure to make that decision had to be enormous. There was no objection from the crew, but he wasn't asking. OK, guys, let's do this. I was scared. I didn't think we were going to survive. Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. This is Air Force Rescue 110, ditching at coordinates. It was something that I don't think everybody really believed was happening, even though it was actually happening. So when he said ditching, I didn't think I could do it. I think it was more of a, a being scared out of my mind. Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. This is Air Force Rescue 110, ditching at With just minutes of fuel remaining, the crew prepares survival equipment and the life raft. Five souls on board. OK, I'm coming to the harbor. I want everyone out of here. Air Force 988 to Air Force Rescue 110. Copy your mayday. Dave hovers just above the crest of the waves to let the crew bail out. The waves now are a lot bigger than what they had been when we were trying to get the guy in the sailboat. Dave is now so close, he runs the risk of a high wave taking the chopper out. OK, I'm not able to hold this much longer. Altitude, Dave, altitude. We're running on fumes. It's time to go. Number one engine offline. It could be seconds before we're going in the water. My number one engine flames out on me. I'm hovering on one engine. I could actually hear the turbines wind down. I knew it was going to fall out of the sky at any moment. Everyone out! Everyone out! They must time their jump to the split second to hit the crest of a wave. If you mistime your jump and hit the trough of a wave, you're looking at falling 70 feet. So hitting the water at 70 feet would be like hitting concrete. But they must jump now. The chopper has only seconds of fuel left. We're running on fumes. It's time to go. Rick will be first to go. If he mistimes his jump, he could fall 20 meters into the trough of a wave and kill himself. He looked like a spring, coiled, ready to jump. I don't recall him ever taking his eyes off of the ocean. He never looked at me. Rick vanishes, and John gets ready to jump. I was looking out of the aircraft at the water. I couldn't tell exactly when to jump because I couldn't tell the difference between the crest of the wave and the trough of the wave. I remember having this thought, oh my god, this is a long way down. I think I ended up going in facing the sky. I was completely out of body position. I know there are going to be consequences, that this is not the ideal way to enter the water. Now there's only a few drops of fuel left. Graham, get ready to go. You're going to. Dave, just do it, Graham. Go, Graham, now. This was a bad situation. The likelihood of surviving it is extremely slim. Only Dave and Jim are left on board. I pushed out the raft. The raft blew up, but then all of a sudden it just went black, and the raft literally just kind of blew away. 
Stunned by the ferocity of the storm, Jim can't bring himself to jump. I just sat back on the floor of the helicopter. Dave didn't know I was back there. Unaware, Dave gets ready to ditch. Once I realized that my crew had exited the helicopter, I moved at a distance uh, that I felt was safe, that I would not put the aircraft down on any of my crew members. And I simply waited for the number two engine to flame out. My mind was thinking in terms of seconds, and what had to be done sequentially, one second after the other. Without a thought for his own safety, Dave flies on a safe distance from his crew. I felt for Dave having to take the helicopter in. I didn't think he would survive the ditching. Dave's out of luck. The second engine flames out. Body of the helicopter hit. It was a boom, boom, instantaneous, a two-fold action. Instantly, the blades contacted the water, and that's when it got really violent. It was like someone took the helicopter itself and just lifted it up and smashed it into the water. The water came in and instantly flushed me out of the cabin. The helicopter immediately filled with water. I mean, the only thought was to get out of the aircraft immediately. But Dave's door is jammed. And I'm thinking to myself, this door is not going to open. surfaced on the ocean, the waves were huge, up to 100 foot. The winds were so strong, you know, basically biting into your face, stinging you. Dave takes hardly a gulp of air before the waves suck him under again. Now I'm in this, you know, huge wash machine of tremendously large waves, uh, really very, very intense. Battling the terrifying waves. Dave has no idea if the rest of his crew have survived. Is anybody there? But close by, Jim has reached the surface and is struggling in the freezing water. I was under long enough to where I had it. I took in some water and I had to vomit it up. And I got to the surface, like, whoa, what the heck just happened? And then the waves immediately start start hitting. Once you know the, the shivering started, which was pretty quickly once I went into the water, uh, it it went from a mild shivering to a severe, and you you, you really that's all you're concentrating. You're, you're you're tensed up. Your your body is just you know getting this. It's like a hammering effect, uh, and you really can't think of anything else except you know being cold. I began to yell. And you know, then I heard a yo back and then a yo, and, and the yo's got louder and louder and louder and louder. And it happened to be Jim Yoli. Hey! I'm okay. When we he and I linked up together, it was a, uh, a feeling of elation. <clears throat> we had somebody to share this dire condition that we were both in. And I grabbed onto his uh, harness, grabbed onto that, because I wasn't losing him. But the elation is short-lived. 
when Dave notices that something is wrong. Where the hell is your survival suit? And I realized immediately that he did not have his uh, exposure suit on. He was already cold. In his desperation to release the life raft, Jim has failed to put on his survival suit. The sea is a numbingly cold 12 Celsius. His life expectancy is just a few hours. I was very concerned that without that suit on, he's, he's definitely not going to survive as long as I am. Here, put this on. Dave offers his hood, risking his own chances of survival, but buying his crewmate valuable time. I got, got it. And I put my hood on his head just to help him out, you know, to maintain any body warmth for him. Dave and Jim are on their own. As far as they know, the rest of the crew are dead. Hold on tight, Jim. I got you. But 400 meters away, John Spillane is trying to hang on to life. I don't recall hitting the water. I remember just evolving into this state of awareness where I realize I am in the ocean. Things start to come back to me. Oh, we just bailed out of the helicopter. We were on a rescue mission. We ran out of fuel. The next thing I recognize is I'm experiencing a lot of pain. John has fallen a terrifying 20 meters into the trough of a wave. Hitting the water at that height is like hitting concrete. His body is shattered. Both wrists, four ribs and his left leg are broken. He's ruptured a kidney bruised his pancreas, burst blood vessels in both eyes. Fluid is massing around his lungs, making breathing agony. I'm desperate. I'm in a desperate situation. I'm being battered by the ocean. I'm being pelted by the water. I'm having a very hard time keeping it out of my mouth. I'm swallowing it. I'm vomiting every, uh, every few minutes. I would hear the rumble coming from above. I was hearing a wave that couldn't support itself, that was just crumbling under its own weight and rolling down its own face. I could hear the white water coming. take me under and it would hold me under for 30 seconds at a time maybe even more my body just went wherever it wanted me to go I couldn't actually swim for the surface I didn't know where it was but the way I thought my end would come that night is that I would no longer have the energy to get my mouth high enough above the water to breathe which means ultimately I would have drowned and that was uh, revealing to me. That was startling. That was something I hadn't ever seen happening to me before, where I would drown on the surface. John fears drowning. But across the waves, it's the cold which threatens to kill Jim. Hold in there, Jim. They know, they know we're here. Shivering was, it just got to be so severe that you just felt like someone was punching me, like a jackhammer effect in, in my back between my shoulder blades. It's only thanks to Dave's hood that Jim has come this far, but his core body temperature is now dangerously low and hypothermia is taking hold. I wasn't sure that Jim would survive overnight. You could just tell by looking at him, you know, things were registering with him 
that he was not 100% with you. Jim's organs are shutting down, and the cold could stop his heart at any moment. The hypothermia just kind of took everything I had, and just that, so, that was my focal point that night. I was just shivering, you know, unbearably. Jim at least has Dave to comfort him. But suffering from the injuries of his 20-meter fall, John has no one. But just when there seems no hope, he spots the life raft thrown from the chopper. When I saw the raft, it was coming to me. I knew that I needed to get into it. I didn't know where it came from. I still didn't know how I had gotten there, and there was no longer time to think about that. I just knew I had to get into this raft. John grabs onto the raft, but he can't get into it. It's upside down. While I'm hanging on to it, I realize it's upside down. I can't get into it. But the floor of the raft is actually above the surface. And I'm being dragged by it. As I'm thinking about this, the wind and the waves flip the raft over. It takes me with it and flips me right into it. I was elated. I actually couldn't believe my luck at that point. I end up flat on the floor. Now I'm spread eagle trying to hold this raft down. Protecting him from the storm, the raft will keep John alive till rescue arrives. I remember feeling it wobbling with the water underneath me. And I was feeling relief. The raft will offer refuge from the storm for John until help arrives. But his luck doesn't last. Another enormous wave capsizes the raft again. It took me completely by surprise, and I ended up back in the water. And it went blowing and cartwheeling away from me. The relief that I'd had for those short moments was over, it was gone. Crippled by his injuries, and lost in hundreds of square kilometers of ocean. John's chances of survival are zero. After I lost contact with the raft, there wasn't anything else for me to do but to survive, just to stay afloat. The sweatsuit I was wearing helped me to do that, and the life preserver helped me to do that. But I will say uh, it was clear to me that ultimately I was going to drown. I was scared. I don't think I'm gonna make it until daylight. I don't think I can last that long. I can feel my condition deteriorating. I started thinking about my wife and our unborn child. My wife giving birth without me being there and raising what would ultimately be a son without me ever meeting him. I'm experiencing abject misery and sadness. There actually came a point where I started to think it would be easier to lay back and just breathe in this water. Lay back and just let happen whatever's gonna happen here. But just when there seems no hope, John spots a distant light. I couldn't see that well, though, because my retinas had hemorrhaged from the impact. I had a blue haze across my eyes. But every once in a while, I would see the strobe. So I'm thinking that there could be human beings attached to those strobes. And that's a good thing. 
but the dilemma was, if I could do anything about closing this distance, do I really want to do that? That was a real dilemma. I don't want to close this gap because I don't want to be there and die in their presence. I want to be by myself. And then I had this recollection uh, from survival training. There's strength in numbers. Stay together as long as you can. And I couldn't ignore that. John signals his position with his scuba light and starts to swim. But a kilometer of ferocious waves and hurricane winds separate him from the strobe light. With such severe injuries, he doesn't know if he can make it. We saw a light, and this light got brighter and brighter. You know, what the hell is it? It's, it's on the surface, and it's not a life raft. And I just kept swimming and swimming. After an hour, I noticed I was closing the gap, that I was getting closer to the strobe light. But as it got closer and closer, and it took a long time to get to us, I realized that it was John Spillane. And uh, I think it was probably another hour before I actually got there. No! John! Are you OK? Jim and I were both elated that we had you know, John with us. It was a great feeling. But we could see the pain on his face of how badly he was injured. John! He was in tremendous pain. Very, very bad pain. I'll get you out of here. My focus shifted from me to Jim's predicament. Seeing the hood on Jimmy Oli, I thought was a very brave act. That simple. I knew that that was decreasing Dave's survivability. But I also recognized what a tremendous uh, help it was to, to Jim, that it was increasing his survivability. Jim can't control his own body. The muscles violently spasm in a bid to generate warmth. But he's on a rapid downward spiral. While I was getting wasted by these waves and, you know, freezing, you know, with the hypothermia, the only real thought I had, it, it is silly, is, is who's taking care of my dog? Like, I hope someone gets my dog so that, you know, they can walk or feed her. Once the rescuers, now the elite crew of Air Force Rescue 110, are in desperate need of rescue themselves. There was one particular wave that drove us under and separated us. And as that happened, I saw the look of terror in John's eyes. He was very, very uh, concerned that if he didn't link back up with us, that his chances of survival were not good. And to see that look of terror on one of your uh, brother's uh, faces, that was a wake-up call to me of just how bad he was. But Dave manages to pull his men back together. He's fighting heroically to keep them alive. Having uh, two individuals with me, both of whom were worse than I was, Jim's body temperature and John's injuries, uh, you know, they needed me. That was a very uh, scary moment because we almost didn't get back together. Even if a rescue can be mounted, the storm has driven them over 30 kilometers from the point they ditched their helicopter. They're now just dots lost in the Atlantic. If Jim isn't rescued soon, he will die. And with each hour, the storm is intensifying. But I was facing the facts, and they were brutal at this point. I felt the odds were against us. I believed we wouldn't survive. With no rescue in sight, 
they face a lingering death, lost in the freezing Atlantic waters. Stay with us, Jim. Stay with us. Dave struggles to keep Jim alive, but he's in the final stages of hypothermia. Jim! He's losing consciousness. Jim, you stay with us. His vital organs are shutting down. <laughs> the hypothermia kind of made me uh, you know, like in and out of awareness of, of what was going on. I was concerned that Jim would go into a coma, yeah. But that's, that's what, how he would eventually go. He was lethargic, he was slow. Jim was uh, slowly fading away. But just when there seems no hope. Over here. Over here. Over here. Over here. All of a sudden, you know, we saw lights kind of like reflecting against the clouds. Their Mayday calls have been picked up. A Coast Guard helicopter has battled 150 kilometer an hour winds to reach them. Their cabin door went open on the right side and their hoist operator actually was sending out a rescue basket on the end of the hoist cable. And we're like, oh, this is great, we'll, we'll be done soon. It was this incredulous feeling that we actually overcame the odds here. Yeah. But as I watched him, I could see his altitude fluctuating. At times, it looked like he was going to be driven right into the sea. At some point, I know Dave Rivola yelled to me that he didn't think he would be trying this, implying that if he had been flying that helicopter, he didn't think he would be trying it. He was right there. He could see us, but he couldn't get us, based on the uh, the, the intense you know, conditions out there. The Coast Guard helicopter battles for an hour, trying to rescue them, before accepting defeat. It was a brave but futile attempt to recover us. But kudos to those guys. They, they gave it all they had for a, for a long time until they had to leave to return to base to refuel. If these guys couldn't pick us up, you know, really, there's no one left. The last survivors of Air Force Rescue 110 have fought to stay together. Now, they will die together. You can't fight Mother Nature. You know, she has her own plans for you. I'm wondering, what point will I be so exhausted that I can't resist anymore? That I can't fight to get air? And that was frightening, because I knew that point was going to come. It was very sad and frustrating, because I wasn't ready. I needed more time. They needed me, and I was going to do whatever I had to do to, you know, make it through, get them through this, get us through. Even to this day, you know, I wonder how Dave had such strong hope. I don't, I don't think he doubted that he was going to see the rest of his life. He was going to, he was going to see the next day and the day after that. Then we saw lights again, and I, I said to the guys, uh, I said, "That's a ship." We could actually see it, and we could see its color. Okay, it was white. It was a beautiful white ship, huge, big white ship. And then they began to fire off illumination flares. It's the Coast Guard ship Tamaroa. Its crew risking capsizing to rescue them. The hope was back. That's the way out. That's our ticket home. Love those guys. Tamaroa Coast Guard all the way. We, by the grace of God, were bound together that night of October 30th, 1991. 
and we will forever be bound together based on that incident. It took Jim Mioli a year to recover from the ordeal. John Spillane underwent a number of operations for his injuries. Dave Revola survived the incident unscathed. They came aboard to find co-pilot Graham Bashaw had already miraculously been picked up. Although you're, you're glad you're alive, we're still missing a crew member, you know, and that's when it really hit home that, you know, there's, there's still somebody out there. And, you know, that was wreck. You know, the Coast Guard cutter continued through the night looking for wreck and continued through the next day. found him and that was particularly hard for 10 days a combined forces operation searched almost a hundred square kilometers of ocean for Rick his body was never found it's so sad that he actually uh, experienced what we all knew was a possibility that that he died doing this job he was willing to take the risk so I'm happy for him in that sense, that he got to live that life. <clears throat> but I'm very sad that he was one of the people who wasn't able to survive his career. He left behind four daughters, the youngest just two weeks old. He died while attempting to save somebody else's life. What better way to go? very, very unfortunate, but that's who Rick was. Rick was a warrior. Rick was dedicated to rescuing people. That's what he did. The perfect storm, as it became known, lasted seven days, caused $200 million of damage to the East Coast, and killed 12 people. All four crewmen returned to active duty. The sailor they'd been sent to rescue was picked up by the Coast Guard the following day. There's a Paris creed that ends with the motto, these things we do that others may live. 